Um, first of all, I would like to thank Heidi and Alan and their incredibly efficient team for organizing such a um, important and fascinating conference that has given us a lot to think about. Um, I'm going to, Cheryl and I are splitting our time. I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, significance of the material from our perspective at the Freer and Sackler, and then um, Cheryl will take you through some of um, what's been happening over the last few months. So, um, so far today, our conversation has gone well beyond the, um, the exhibition that was the starting point for this conference about underwater cultural heritage in Southeast Asia. But since it's the exhibition itself, which um, initially was the um, reason to bring us together, I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about exactly why it's so important and why the Sackler was so um, interested in being a part of this project. The Belatong and its cargo give us a global picture of a narrow window of about 75 years in the 9th century CE. Um, they tell a story that involves three major empires, three major regions of the world perhaps would be a more accurate way to talk about it. China as a, um, an exporter of goods on a massive scale, the Middle East as a huge consumer of those goods, and Southeast Asia as the fulcrum for that relationship, uh, the kind of pinch point of the trade that, um, that allowed that relationship. The wreck is a rare survival of a very specific historic moment, the early 9th century, where the p particular political and economic circumstances in both China and the Abbasid Empire in, based in Baghdad allowed this period of intense, trade, of intense trade that was transformative, especially in terms of ceramic history. And I think that that point that um, it was a specific historic moment is one that is important to remember because we've heard today about so many wrecks and all of those wrecks have a story. Some stories might be more important in terms of the cultural history, economic history, our understanding of our shared global um, circumstances than others. And I think the Belletong is one of those, which is just crucially important. It gives us information that we just don't have from any other, um, any other sources. Um, the wreck changed what we knew. Um, clearly, as, we, as we've seen in both the exhibition and the catalog to the exhibition, the recovery and the study of the wreck and its cargo have replaced what, what preceded, um, preceded the wreck and its cargo, which was um, discrete and far-flung fragments of evidence that gave us um, some sense. Now we have a picture that is of the period that is both panoramic and detailed based on what we have been able to study from the cargo. We had scant textual evidence from different sources within the Islamic world. We had fragmentary excavated remains from the site of Samara and other Abbasid sites in Iraq. Now we have a wealth of material that allows us to visualize a maritime silk route that was clearly well developed and of great economic significance in the ninth century. So as Mike has um, given us so much information this morning, this was the first Arab ship that was found in Southeast Asian waters. Until the wreck was excavated and especially the material from the second season analyzed, our best evidence concerning the ships that might have been used for the maritime trade in this period were Im images such as the um, painting on the, in the lower corner of the screen, which is actually from um, a much later medieval Islamic manuscript, the Makamat of al-Hariri, which gives us this wonderfully detailed picture of a, um, of a ship, but we know from studying this manuscript that there were artistic conventions involved in depiction. It's a two-dimensional image. It's at a distance of several centuries from the period of time that it's meant to represent. So as evidence, it's helpful, but nothing like the excavated remains that we now have as, um, as a result of the, um, of the excavation. Now we have enough information 
that was um, recovered to allow the replica that Mike talked about in his presentation and of which you see a photograph um, on the screen. The other thing that was, another thing that was so impressive about this um, excavation in terms of understanding, visualizing, was no one would have predicted this, the quantity of goods that were, that were shipped on such a small ship unless it had been, that information had been visual, visually seen, had been seen. So that's another piece that um, this excavation has provided to us. So um, the excavation and the research that has gone on following it confirms the existence of this maritime trade route that eclipsed the Silk Road in the ninth century. So um, ceramics became an, an object, a, a category of objects that could be moved by ship, not necessarily the most attractive cargo to be moved overland by camel, which is, um, it's an important piece of, um, also of historic information that is confirmed by this excavation. These wonderful Changsha bowls, bowls that exist in so many thousands of copies on the ship, um, give us evidence of China China and its aspirations as an export giant in this period. So I think um, it's really impossible to say what aspect of the wreck and its finds are the most extraordinary since the evidence from the excavations has caused us to reevaluate so many different aspects of the economic, cultural, and art history of the period. But surely the discovery of these 47,000, 53,000, however, whatever that number is of these bulls with their evidence of mass production and their signaling of China's desire to be a, um, to trade on a scale beyond the local. Surely these bulls are among the most important of the finds. Their recovery provides evidence that just would not have been believed without that physical evidence because the numbers are so staggering. We also found, we see from um, the cargo that was excavated, things that were previously known only in literature or in a fragmentary state. And these are objects that have been um, discussed in huge detail in our catalog, which I certainly hope all of you will have looked at. So I don't want to spend too much time on them here, but the, um, the splashware and this wonderful singular example of the mirror that um, was found on the wreck are certainly two of those examples. The wreck and its contents speak to us on so many different levels. The Changsha bowls as evidence of um, mass production, the individual objects that um, we would not have known about otherwise or have, would have known about only through texts. Um, all of this rounds out our picture of the period in a way that we could not have anticipated. In other cases, the cargo provides new and crucial evidence for production and trade that we only would have known about before through, um, through texts. Again, um, the whiteware that's discussed in the catalog and this incredibly crucial piece of blue and white uh, China uh, ware that is evidence of this intense ongoing for over a period of many centuries communication, a trade between the Middle East and China that was to have such an impact on the development of ceramics in, um, in a global context. Um, shaping some of the best known ceramic traditions of the pre-modern world, um, the Hispano-Moresque tradition, Italian Maiolica, and Delftware. So this piece starts that conversation and tells us about it. For the Islamic world, the Belaton cargo provides concrete evidence of trade in a, in a discrete period that was to have a fundamental impact on medieval Islamic material culture going, going forward. We have these pieces like this incredible monumental ewer that have stories to tell us, and one of the um, one of the interesting, surprising consequences of the exhibition has been a um, a gap that has been revealed that I think many people know about, but I I was struck by how um, 
how stringent that gap seems to be between archaeologists and art historians and how they think about the material and the kinds of questions they ask about it. So for instance, this ewer comes to us as a result of archaeological effort. And from that archaeological effort, we know a great deal about it. We know where it was found. We know the ship that it was traveling on. But after having been excavated, it's often the art historians who come in and do the next stage of the investigation and try to keep the story of this object going forward into next generation. So why was this you were made? For whom was it made? Why does it have the form that it does? Did it have an impact on pieces that followed it? These are the kinds of questions that the art historians who will work on this material that we have as a result of archaeological efforts, these are the kinds of questions that they would like to answer. We would not be able to ask those questions were it not for this excavation. So this is, um, this is what I hope will happen with this material going forward, with that you are with this gold cup, with this incredible array of objects that the, um, the excavation has, um, has provided for us. Now we have this amazing exhibition. Um, I think that when you walk through the exhibition, when you have that opportunity, you get a sense of the relationships between these objects, of the stories that can be told from them and about them that is quite different than what you understand from reading the book, the catalog, or what you understand from um, seeing the individual objects on their own as objects of study, which is why we think it's so important that this exhibition travel, that as many people as possible have the opportunity to understand this larger picture in the way that's possible only through the exhibition. So that brings me, of course, to the controversy surrounding the exhibition. Um, there are um, many people who believe that this material should not ever have been e exhibited, that it should not be exhibited going forward. There are even people who believe that it shouldn't have been excavated in the first place. So to walk you through some of those conversations, I will turn this over to my colleague, Cheryl. Thanks, Nancy. Um, and thanks to um, old friends who I have the pleasure of seeing again here in Singapore and to all of the wonderful um, colleagues that I've met for the first time. Um, it was not long after our initial releases about the organization and preparation of the exhibition that the Smithsonian began to receive expressions of concern from various professional archaeological associations. These concerns rise from issues related to the recovery and to the transfer of the collection which um, I will summarize because these issues really do encapsulate um, the issues that we're talking about at this conference. Um, so we'll begin at the beginning with um, a very brief review of the recovery, some of which you've heard about this morning from Mike Flecker, um, but a few more details from the non-archaeological side um, will also perhaps fill in some of those details. So the site we were told of the Bellatung wreck was clearly, it was being looted, and that's been confirmed um, after its discovery by sea cucumber fishermen. So in early 1998, the Indonesian government licensed a local salvage company to recover the contents. And this local salvage company engaged seabed explorations to provide the necessary resources for that recovery. As you heard Mike explain in great detail, um, the recovery was accomplished over two seasons. The first season saw a recovery of a great quantity of the ceramics and the majority of the precious material, the gold and other important items, including um, the blue and white dish and its companions. In the second season, um, the recovery was of more of the commercial wares, some additional unique items like the white wares, and extensive effort was spent on the documentation of what is perhaps the largest find, the ship itself. After the, after the recovery, the Indonesian government issued export licenses for the cargo to be taken to New Zealand and Germany for further cataloging, conservation, and initial study by experts. 
the Indonesian government and seabed then entered a complex contractual arrangement over the ownership of the cargo. In 2005, the vast bulk of the cargo is sold by seabed to Sentosa Leisure Group, a statutory board under the Singapore Ministry of Trade and Industry. Multiple sources have indeed confirmed that seabed in its arrangement with Indonesia stipulated that the cargo it recovered should be kept and sold as a single collection. Very important to remember that as we go forward. So in considering the Balatung cargo, we really should consider events from both legal and ethical perspectives. So first we'll look at the recovery within the context of the existing law of the time. And why are we doing this? Well, given our role in the organization of the exhibition and the expressions of concern that we were receiving, and they were coming in rapidly um, a few months ago, quite rapidly, the Smithsonian's Office of General Counsel reviewed um, all of the available documentation concerning the recovery and the sale of the cargo you know, with the, the incredibly important and generous co um, cooperation of our organizational partners. So the review that was conducted by our Office of General Counsel um, came to the conclusion that we, the Smithsonian, had no reasonable basis to conclude that the exhibition would violate any applicable U.S. or international law or Smithsonian policy because the legal title to the cargo appears to have been valid and there's no evidence that the objects comprising the cargo were exported from Indonesia in violation of either Indonesian or any other international law. So everyone, including these archaeological associations from whom we've been hearing, everyone agrees that from a legal perspective, everything's fine. So the objections really move into the realm of ethics. So the report that our Office of General Counsel completed states that ethical standards and policies governing professional organizations and institutions and their engagement with underwater cultural heritage, they differ slightly in their language and the degree. However, almost all of these standards and policies condemn and prohibit the commercial exploitation and unscientific excavation of archaeological sites, including underwater sites. So professional archaeological ethics policies, which are really at the crux of the arguments here, say that underwater cultural heritage shall not be traded, sold, bought, or bartered as commercial goods, and that when wrecks are recovered, the process must be overseen by qualified archaeologists and executed according to the highest scientific standards. And these prohibitions are central to the UNESCO Convention on the Protection of Underwater Cultural Heritage of 2001, which has been referenced several times through the talks this morning. And that convention is reflected very strongly in the policies and publications of many professional organizations such as CAM and ICAM, ACUA and ICMAS. But as you may be beginning to deduce from the talks you've heard thus far, the case of the Bellaton cargo is certainly more complex than many originally understood. So we really are faced with two principal objections from the archaeological community. There was no science. But as you have heard in great detail from Mike Flecker's excellent, excellent um, paper this morning, there was plenty of science. There was. The ship was thoroughly documented. Field notes, drawings were made, segments recovered, wood and fiber samples taken. This information very much contributed to the reconstruction of the Jewel of Muscat, that reconstruction of the ship. Organic material. Yes, you know, folks are not just interested in the pretty things, as some would like everyone to believe. Organic material was recovered, allowing the identification of some of the spices and other natural materials carried on the ship. Extensive study and conservation treatment was performed, including x-ray examinations of objects, and testing allowed the fingerprinting of the ceramics so that they could be matched to specific kiln sites in China. But on the other hand, there were problems documentation appears to be less than ideal in the first season, and many archaeologists are indeed questioning the pace of the recovery. The other objection deals with the financial arrangements related to the cargo. The recovery involved a commercial entity. 
And the feeling among many of these professional organizations is that commercial companies treat objects as mere instruments of profit rather than important pieces of a shared world cultural heritage. And because that profit motivation, important historical, anthropological, or archaeological information is lost if it's not documented by qualified professionals. And therefore, the exhibition of the cargo would undermine these preservation efforts. However, and this is where you know, things being more complex than what one might think. In the case of the Belaton cargo, the commercial company engaged marine archaeologists and scientists to assist in the recovery and the study of the objects once removed. The commercial company attempted to reacquire objects that had been looted from the site prior to its official engagement with the recovery. And the commercial company insisted that the material recovered by its operation be kept together as a single collection and not sold piecemeal on the market we would not be able to see that totality of the story of this particular ship if those objects had been dispersed and could not be experienced together. So in conclusion, the specifics of the Belaton cargo have implications for the management of, cultural underwater, of underwater cultural heritage in the region, well, around the world for that matter, as well as for what is learned from such material how that is shared, and that's really what we hope um, this, co this conference will be a start of much more detailed discussions and so that we can work through things that will satisfy all interested constituencies because it is a shared heritage. Thank you. <laughs>